This is the Natural History Museum. Welcome to NHM Live. In a couple of minutes, you'll be meeting one of our scientists. This is your chance to ask some questions directly. We look forward to hearing from you. Let's find out who our scientist is today. My name's Paul Barrett, and I'm one of the research scientists behind the scenes here at the museum. My particular specialisation is dinosaurs, and I use our collections to work out more about how dinosaurs lived, died, and how they were related to each other. I've always been interested in dinosaurs since the age of around six, and I'm lucky enough to have what's essentially many people's dream job working here with the amazing collection at the museum. I've been at the museum now for nearly 15 years, and in that time I've seen a huge amount of new work come out on dinosaurs, not only on our collection, but also around the world. Even our own collection, for example, we've seen something like 10 new species of dinosaurs emerge just from going through material that we already had lying in our drawers. The museum is a fabulous place for a dinosaur researcher, not only because of the quality of its collections and the history that goes along with it, but also because of the other facilities we have behind the scenes to study dinosaurs, and also my colleagues, who give us lots of amazing new ideas on how to work on these animals. Hi everyone, welcome to season two of NHM Live. My name is Alistair, I'm going to be your host for today's show and today we're going to be looking at dinosaurs, our most popular specimens of all. Now, if you've got any questions uh, today, do send them in, we're going out live, so if you've got any questions today about dinosaurs, send them to us, we'll try and get through as many of them as we can during the show. And joining me today is museum paleontologist Paul Barrett and he's uh, going to be talking to us about some of these amazing fossils that we've brought along today. Thanks very much Paul hey, for evening. joining us today. Uh, so we're going to look at dinosaurs today. Now everyone has heard of some dinosaurs, there's the classics T-Rex, Diplodocus, you know everyone knows these ones but most people only know sort of five or six species and they always seem to be the same ones. Why is that do you think? I think it's for a couple of different reasons. I think those six really famous dinosaurs, things like Stegosaurus, Tyrannosaurus, they're bizarre animals by today's standards. They have plates and spines and frills and horns, giant teeth, giant claws. So for that reason, they really embed themselves in people's imaginations. Yeah. I also think it's partly because those dinosaurs were also named quite a long time ago, back in the 19th century. So there's been plenty of time for them to become embedded in our consciousness. And they also tend to be the ones that are the stars, the A-list stars of Hollywood B-movies all the way through to blockbuster movies. Right, so we've seen them in Jurassic Park and things like that, they're the ones that we, we all remember. Now a lot of the, the species that we know, uh, certainly from the movies, are often species from North America, is that true? Yeah, I'd say it's fairly dominated by animals from North America because a lot of the really good skeletons came out of that part of the world early in the history of studying dinosaurs. Excellent, well we're going to go on a bit of a world tour today uh, and have a look at some dinosaurs from other parts of the world that you may not be so familiar with and have a look at some of the fossils. Now the first uh, ones we're going to look at today are actually from Britain and actually Britain is uh, quite well known in terms of it was one of the first places dinosaur fossils were described, is that true? That's absolutely right, in fact Britain holds a very central role in describing dinosaurs as a group of animals and the first dinosaurs are actually scientifically described all from here in the UK named in the early part of the 19th century. Excellent. Okay, well we've got a question in from uh, Jill Mayer on Facebook. She's saying, uh, which was the most dangerous dinosaur? Oh, that's a that's good question. That's an interesting question, that one. It's like it? the killer death match question, isn't yes. it? For which what would win? <laughs> it's a difficult one to answer. So, I mean, T-Rex is probably the animal that would win most of those fights. Mm -hmm. It's a very big meat-eating animal, 12 and a half metres long, and with a bite that's about three or four times as strong as that of a living African lion. So a serious piece of work. Wow. There are other big meat-eating dinosaurs too, uh, but we don't know as much about those animals. So uh, you'd have to speculate quite a lot on who'd actually win that fight. So in mm. terms of things that we know about, T-Rex is probably the meanest one, uh, but there are other bigger ones out there that might have been uh, contenders for that crown. Well, that's interesting. T-Rex may deserve its kind of famous reputation. Then. Yeah, quite possibly. Excellent. Well, T-Rex, as you said, comes from North America, but in the UK, we actually have our own equivalent of a T-Rex, don't we? Can you tell us about that? We have plenty of carnivorous dinosaurs in the UK, actually, though we don't have very many skeletons of them, but mainly lots of isolated bones. Yeah. So this animal right here in front of us, for example, this is a single bone, yeah. a hip bone, uh, so this kind of bone around this part of your right. body here, and this is of an animal called Megalosaurus. And Megalosaurus, which name. means large lizard, yep. is actually the first dinosaur that was to be named scientifically back in 1824. So this is one of the older fossils in our collection as well in terms of uh, from the history of discovery. And this is an animal that, like a T-Rex, was a big carnivorous dinosaur, walked on its hind legs only, and it would have been a fairly major predator of its time, around 9 to 10 metres in length. 
So we've got, you say, the, one of the hip bones here. Do we, do we have the whole skeleton? Is this a, a species we've got lots of bones for? Sadly not. Megalosaurus is a little bit of an enigma. We've never found a complete skeleton. And in fact, all the bones that we have are generally found isolated, although luckily we have hundreds of different bones from the UK of this animal. So we have a fairly good idea of what most of its skeleton looked like. But unfortunately, that key uh, specimen that might tie them all together is still proving elusive, and we don't have a complete specimen yet. Okay, another question in from Jill Mayer on Facebook. She's saying, uh, do you believe they died out because a meteor hit the Earth? So I guess that's a very well-known theory about what, why they went extinct. I think one of the things that people often think about with dinosaurs is actually not so much what they were like as living animals, but the amazing circumstances of their demise. Mm -hmm. So actually, the idea of a meteorite hitting the Earth is one that is now very firmly embedded in our ideas of how dinosaurs became extinct. There's excellent evidence for it. We know that there's a crater and that crater's buried on the seafloor off of what's now Mexico. Uh, we also know that lots of other things around the world are consistent with that in terms of evidence of huge tsunamis or tidal waves, soot deposits from around the world at the right time. So there's really good evidence there was a meteorite strike, which is probably a very significant part of why so many of those dinosaurs died out. Excellent, okay. Well, sticking with the, uh, the T-Rex megalosaur theme, You've got another fossil today that you're going to show us. Now, this is a really valuable fossil. And in fact, it's the only one of its kind anywhere in the world. So this is a real, a real scoop to, to see this today. Now, what, what are we looking at here? This fantastic looking skull by the looks of it. So I'm handling this very gingerly because, as you said, it's a unique example. This is the only example of this particular dinosaur species in existence. It's from the UK. It's actually from Gloucestershire. And it's from not very far from where Megalosaurus comes next door in Oxfordshire. OK. Uh, so, and it's also about the same age as Megalosaurus, so about 165 million years old. And this little animal, as you can see, is a fairly ferocious predator. It has very sharp, pointed teeth. Uh, but this is the earliest known ancestor of T. rex. So an animal wow. called Proceratosaurus. OK, that might be a new one for a few people. But when you say the answer, this is the sort of beginnings of what eventually would become the T-Rex that we all know. That's exactly right. So we've already said T-Rex, one of the largest carnivorous animals of all time, one of the most ferocious. But they actually had fairly humble origins. So this is still a fairly nasty small predator, but it's a fraction of the size of a T-Rex. This is an animal that's going to be uh, only about three or four metres in total length, including a very long, slender tail, much more lightly built and not nearly as ferocious as its later cousin. Excellent. Uh, so I have another question that's uh, come through from uh, Samantha on face Facebook. She's uh, asking, uh, how were the periods, for example, Jurassic, Cretaceous, I imagine, how were they uh, decided? Like, how did we delineate those periods? So that's a really long answer, unfortunately. <laughs> but the quick version of it is we know that different types of rocks have different sorts of fossils in. Mm -hmm. Those different sorts of fossils show different stages of evolution through the history of Earth through time. And what happened was people realised that those same kinds of fossils, rough kinds of fossils, could be found all over the world. They seem to be restricted to certain packages of rocks. And using that idea, they were able to build up different packages of rocks based on their fossil content. And that's how they worked out that some of these things were older than others because the rocks are on top of other rocks and some rocks are under other rocks. Right. And by using all those kinds of evidence, they managed to come up with this geological time scale that we divide into periods. Right. And the names of the periods reflect either areas of the world where those rocks are particularly well exposed so we can study them well, or maybe some feature of those rocks. So for example, the Carboniferous period is named after the fact that there's huge deposits of coal off the carbon and the carbon, the carbon. Makes sense. So there is, a, there is a set of rules that governs that kind of thing, but it's uh, actually um, initially based on the fossils and how they line up through the rock sequences we see around the world. Excellent. Well, I'll let you pop that, uh, that fossil yeah, back for now because I know it's very valuable. Thank you one. very much for, for bringing that out. Do keep your questions coming in, guys. We've got uh, plenty more uh, fossils we're going to have a look at. Um, I've got another question that's just come in from Mark on Facebook. Um, uh, he would like to know what, uh, what it would be like if the meat-eating dinosaurs survived until today. Well, I guess uh, that's an interesting question. What, what would you make of that? I suspect, first of all, you'd want to lock your door properly at night and <laughs> yep. things like that and probably wouldn't want to go out on your own too much. Uh, of course, a number of meat-eating dinosaurs have survived today because birds are dinosaurs and are actually direct descendants of the meat-eating oh, dinosaurs. Yeah. So that's the easy answer. Actually, we still have meat-eating dinosaurs today, but luckily, from our point of view, about the most frightening one of those would be a vulture or a condor rather than a tyrannosaurus or a lost raptor. Uh, but I think if lot. we had them today, we'd be looking at uh, dealing with them in much the same way that we deal with the large mammalian predators of life today, lions and tigers and so on. They probably wouldn't be that common because meat eaters aren't that common in comparison with the plant eaters that they eat. So they'd still be something to be worried about, but luckily I don't think we'd see huge herds of them 
queuing up on Wimbledon Common or anything like that. <laughs> OK, well, there you go. There's an answer to your question, Mark. Now, I'm sure while you're watching, you can't help but notice there's a rather big specimen just behind us. Now, this magnificent animal here is another local British dinosaur. Can you tell us about this? And is, is this uh, a big meat-eating predator? So this, is, this isn't a real fossil. This is a replica of real fossils in our collection uh, to give an idea of what the three-dimensional view of this animal would be. It's an animal called Baryonyx. It was actually discovered only in 1983, and it's uh, one skeleton is known, which is here in our collections at the museum, although there are a few other bones known from elsewhere in the UK on the Isle of Wight and one or two other places around the world. But the main skeleton is, is here in our collections. And this is a very unusual meat-eating dinosaur. Most e meat-eating dinosaurs ate meat. For, yep. That's why I call them meat-eating yeah. dinosaurs. But this is one that probably ate something different, and we think that Baryonyx is a specialist fish-eating dinosaur. Well, that's interesting. How, how can you tell? Because obviously you only have the bones to work with. How, how can you come to that conclusion? Uh, so what we do when we try and work out the diet of any dinosaur is the first thing we look at is the shape of the teeth. That gives us an idea about whether they're using their teeth to slice through flesh or grind plants or things like that. And in the case of baryonyx, the teeth are very like those of a living crocodile, which are used mainly for stabbing onto and grabbing onto fish. And if you look at the skull in general of baryonyx, you can see it's got a very long snout. It's not like the kind of stout, strong snout you'd see in a Velociraptor or Tyrannosaurus. Instead, it's very long, much more crocodile-like. And again, that gives a hint that it may be eating fish rather than meat. But the real clincher with baryonyx is we actually have a gut content. We actually have the uh, la remains of its last meal that were preserved alongside wow. it in its skeleton, and that gut content contains fish scales. It tells us all about it. Excellent. Uh, well, Baryonyx, a uh, very large specimen there, but we're going to take a trip uh, to another part of the world next. Now, we had some huge specimens that were too big for us to bring into the studio. So a little bit earlier on, uh, Paul and I went behind the scenes to have a look at some large material from other parts of the world. So let's have a look and see how we got on. <music> When we think of dinosaurs, we often think of the really, really big giants, uh, but there, some of those are too big to get into the studio. So I've come down here into the storeroom with Paul to have a look at some of the bigger specimens in the collection. So Paul, have we got, are all the dinosaurs in this storeroom here? Is that all our fossils? They are. Everything that we don't have on public display is right here in this, in this room, in this basement, keeping them nice and safe. Excellent. Now we're going to have a look at a couple of key specimens that I thought look amazing. Now this one down here really grabbed my attention. Can you tell us what this is? Sure. So what we're looking at here are two backbones of one animal, an animal that we call Giraffa Titan. <laughs> giraffe Titan is an amazing name. What, what, how did you get that name? So Giraffe Titan means giraffe giant. Right. And it's because it's one of the sauropod dinosaurs, a relative of Dippy, the Diplodocus, so a very long neck. And they use that very long neck, obviously, for feeding from high vegetation on tops of trees, hence the giraffe reference. So it sounds a bit like um, the Brachiosaurus, the description. Is, is it similar to that? It is, and actually this animal used to be called Brachiosaurus at one time. Okay. Uh, there's Brachiosaurus both from North America, uh, living at the same time as Dippy, but also from Africa at the same time. And these bones are from the African species. And it was recently found a couple of minor differences between the North American and African species, which were more into giving the African material its own new name. Excellent. So I think people are very familiar with the North American materials. It's interesting to think there were equivalents in, in other continents. A very close relative living at almost the same time. Fantastic. Well, let's go and have a look. We've got a few other specimens from that same part of the world that we're going to have a look at. Sure. Let's go and have a look. OK, so what's the next thing we're going to, to see around here? So we're now going to stay with African dinosaurs and look at another really big bone here in our collection. And this is actually part of a skeleton that was collected, uh, some of which you can see in this cupboard behind us as well. But this is one of the single largest bones that we have, not only of this animal, but in the collection. Amazing. Well, let's take a look. So this is it here. It's, sure. This is a single want... bone, but it's actually covered up here. Shall we? That's exactly right. So if you grab that end, we'll okay. take that off. It's covered. So this is just a fiberglass ah, case to help keep the bone safe and keep it together. So this is a thigh bone, a single thigh bone of another long-necked sauropod dinosaur, so another relative of Dippy. Uh, but this is one that we don't yet know what it is. It doesn't wow. have a name. And again, it's from Africa, like Giraffa Titan, but unlike Giraffa Titan, this is from a different country. It's from Niger. And it's also a bit older. So Giraffa Titan is about 150 million years old. This animal probably close to 160, 165 million years old. So a bit earlier in time, but still within the same Jurassic period, just a bit older. 
Incredible. So have we got the complete skeleton of this? You mentioned these are a lot of the bones associated Unfortunately, with it. Unfortunately, not a complete skeleton. Very few dinosaurs are known from complete skeletons around the world. Uh, but what we do have is quite a lot of the skeleton. So we have a lot of the arm bones, leg bones, some of the bones from the back, some of the teeth. So we have a fairly good impression of what this animal would have looked like. And can you tell just from this bone how big, how tall the, the animal would have been? We can have a guess, and this is actually a really big thigh bone. This is the same kind of size actually as Dippy's thigh bone. And with the other bits of the skeleton that we know about, we're looking at an animal that's probably somewhere between 22 and 25 metres long. Wow. So it's a, it's a big animal. It's a real giant. Excellent. We've got one more I want to look at as well before we sure. go, just around here. Now, this one really caught my eye because of some remarkable preservation, but uh, what species of, of dinosaur is this? So what we're looking at here is a duck-billed dinosaur. We've changed time and we've changed continent. So now we're in North America, we're actually in Canada, and now we're about 75, 80 million years ago, so coming towards the end of the age of the dinosaurs, and this is an animal actually called Edmontosaurus. Right, now the, the, what, there's some remarkable preservation here that I want to talk about, particularly this area here. Now, when I was a kid, we're always told, you know, the bones of the dinosaur are preserved. That's what we've got here. But there's actually a bit more preserved in this case as well. What, no, that's this? right. So we've got lots of bones lined up and nicely joined together. But right here, what we've got is actually a patch of fossilised skin. So you can see when you look in very closely, just here you can see lots and lots of tiny what look like grains in the sand, but they're not. They're actually the impressions of small hexagonal scales, just like those you'd see on the tail of a living lizard or a living crocodile. So this helps us, gives us some idea of what the exterior of the animal to look like as well as just the bones. Fantastic. Must be a rare find to get the skin preserved. It's pretty rare. I mean, this part of the world, these kinds of specimens do turn up occasionally. And we're lucky enough to have duck-billed dinosaurs with complete skin all over the body. But it's not so common elsewhere. But here you can see not only the bones still in their natural connection, but also as well as the skin, these structures here are actually the uh, tendons of the animal also preserved. Fantastic. <laughs>Uh, welcome back everyone. If you've just joined us, I'm here with museum paleontologist Paul Barrett. We are looking at dinosaurs from all over the world, having a close look at some of the magnificent fossils from behind the scenes here in the Natural History Museum. If you've got any questions about dinosaurs for Paul, send them our way. We'll do our best to answer as many of them as we can during the show. Uh, so Paul, we've had a few questions come in uh, just now. Uh, we've got one question that's come from Rachel Kibble. She says, my little boy wants to know how old the T-Rex lived for. That's a good question. It used to be thought that dinosaurs used to live a very long time. Some people thought they lived to be 100 years old, 120 years old. But we now know that most of them actually grew very quickly and died fairly young. So the oldest T-Rexes that we have good information for look like they died at the age of about 32 or 33 years old. So not particularly old, but they grew very, very quickly as teenagers to reach that gigantic size. That's interesting. Is that, is, does anything grow that fast alive today? They grew at rates that are not too dissimilar from some weight, the way that we grow. So that mammal, the, the speed that mammals grow at or the speed that birds grow at. So they were very, very fast growing reptiles. Incredible. They must have had a lot of food to feed that yeah, growth absolutely. as well. Excellent. We've got another question in. This is from Dylan, age six. He'd like to know, what is the biggest dinosaur ever? Okay, well, Dylan, that's one of my favourite questions because it comes down to one of the groups of dinosaurs that I work on quite a bit. So it's a sauropod dinosaur, so a relative of, of Dippy, a uh, favourite here at the museum. And it's an animal called Argentinosaurus, which is very imaginatively named because it's from um, Argentina. Argentina. <laughs> and Argentinosaurus weighed about 70 tonnes which is about the same as 12 fully grown male African elephants. So wow. it's a big animal. That's a huge animal. There you go, Dylan. Um, and uh, following on, you're talking about a sauropod there. We've got a question from Grib68 on Periscope. He's saying, uh, uh, or she's rather, uh, any sauropod fossils found in Britain? We do have some sauropod fossils in Britain, not very many. We don't have a particularly big, spectacular skeleton, unfortunately, but we have a couple of fairly good skeletons. So there's one uh, that you can see in the Leicester City Museum, for example, of an animal called Cetiosaurus. Behind the scenes here at the museum, we have a couple of partial skeletons of sauropods from the UK, another one called Cetiosauriscus from Peterborough, and we have one or two other semi-complete fossils from around the other parts of the UK. Unfortunately, there's a group that we have a number of bones from, but so far that really big, complete skeleton is, is lacking. Yeah, I guess the complete skeletons look amazing, but hard to come by. Fantastic. And uh, another question here, this is from Mark on Facebook. Uh, are we sure that the dinosaurs really looked how we show them? 
We always have to change our ideas on dinosaurs. So since dinosaurs were first found, we thought of them largely as big, scaly, reptile-like animals. A big uh, sea change in what we view of dinosaurs since I've been uh, working on them is that now we know that many dinosaurs would have been feathered. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's something that simply wouldn't have occurred to many of those early anatomists working on those first dinosaur bones. So in the last 20 years or so, we've gone from a view of dinosaurs as being very scaly animals and just looking like souped up lizards or crocodiles, to at least some of them having a complete coating of feathering all over their body, which is a, a major difference. Uh, and one of the other things that we don't know about dinosaurs is really what colour they were. There are some mm -hmm. dinosaurs we do have good information, but only a handful. In most cases, it's still a bit of guesswork. Well, that's interesting. I remember when I was a kid, I think people said, we'll never know the colour of dinosaurs just because we've got the bones. So even the fact that some of them we're beginning to know is quite a big step forward. Yeah, it's been a major advance in the last three, uh, even three or four years. Excellent. Well, let's take a look at uh, some of the specimens that we've got on the table that you've brought along today. Now, we've been going on this world tour around uh, looking at dinosaurs. We've been at Britain, we've had a look at some in Africa and North America. What about these three vertebrae on the table? They're from a very unusual place, aren't they? They are. So these are from a place where it's very difficult to find fossils, which is Antarctica. And these are actually from one of the very small islands off of the Antarctic Peninsula, called Vega Island. And these are fossils that were collected by a museum expedition back in the late 1980s. Fantastic. Now, Antarctica, incredibly cold, hostile environment. When I think of dinosaurs, I'm usually actually thinking of a kind of hot, humid environment. Now, I'm guessing the climate when the dinosaurs were there was completely different to what it is today. Oh, absolutely. Certainly dinosaurs wouldn't have been able to live there the way it is now, covered in sheets of ice and so on. But fossils from that time, the fossil plants, for example, show us that Antarctica was really lush at that time. So it wasn't tropical heat, mm. uh, because it's still at the top end of the world. It would have been dark for a large part of the year. But you still have extensive forests, still nice cool temperatures, but never any permanent ice. So it would have still got cold. These dinosaurs would have seen snow, but it wouldn't have been there all year round and probably only for a short part of the season. Right. Now, the specimens that you've brought here, we've got, this is just a few bones from, from a speci the specimen from Antarctica, but it's still unknown. Is that right? We actually haven't got a name for it yet? That's right. This is a dinosaur that I'm working on at the moment with a number of colleagues here behind the scenes at the museum. This is a new type of dinosaur. It's probably a relative of dinosaurs, more familiar dinosaurs like Iguanodon or Hypsilophodon from the UK. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's an animal that we're still working on to try and work out exactly where it fits in the family tree. Excellent. Okay, well, uh, I'm guessing uh, we, we, you might have answered this already. If we find them in Antarctica, we've got a question from Ali Painter. Uh, I hope I pronounced that right. Uh, on Periscope, uh, asking, uh, I'm from Italy. Are there any from Italy? Any Dinosaurs answers? from Italy? Yeah, yeah, there are a few. Not so many at the moment, but people have only really been looking uh, hard for dinosaurs in Italy for a relatively short time. Right. So there are some really nice dinosaur specimens from Italy. There's a, a big duckbill dinosaur called Tethys hasteros, and there's actually a beautiful little meat-eating dinosaur from Italy called Scyphionyx, which is so well-preserved it even has traces of its guts. It's an amazing little specimen, but Fantastic. very small, only an animal only about the size of a crow. So it sounds like uh, more, more digging needs to be done in Italy. I, I'm sure there are a lot more surprises to come from Italy in well, the future. Well, there you go, Ali Painter. You can do some digging and find a few more for yourself. Uh, another question from Samantha on Facebook. Uh, what's the latest discovery that you're aware of in, in dinosaur research? Well, new dinosaurs are found almost every week. So really? there are wow. huge things going on around the world all the time. So on average, about 60 new dinosaurs are named from around the world. So it's a case of just taking your pick. So, for example, just this week, we've had a couple of new dinosaurs being described from China, new early bird relatives of dinosaurs, something called Dowlingosaurus. So there are a number of these things popping up everywhere. It's actually quite difficult to keep up oh, uh, wow. with the rate of new names coming out. That's incredible. So that just shows when we were talking about those at the beginning, those kind of five or six key dinosaurs people all know, it's the tip of a huge and growing iceberg of, of new dinosaurs. Absolutely. Fantastic. Uh, let's say uh, we've got a few more coming in, guys. Do, do keep the questions coming. This one's from uh, Carol Brown on Facebook. Um, She's saying, we're visiting the Jurassic Coast in the summer. Where's a good beach to go hunting for fossils? Uh, there are lots of great places along the Jurassic Coast to look for fossils. I'd say my favourite place, personally, though, is Charmouth. So Charmouth is a small village just outside Lyme Regis, and historically it's one of the places that lots of fossils have come from. Uh, so there are dinosaur fossils that have been found from Charmouth, lots and lots of fossils of marine reptiles, like ichthyosaurs in particular. And it's a place where Mary Anning, the very famous early fossil hunter, found a lot of her key finds. You, it's very difficult to uh, spend a day at Charmouth without coming back with a handful of fossils. Right, excellent. Well, we've got uh, another specimen on the table here that I'd like to, to talk about. I'm sure people are curious as to what we've got here. Now, looking at this, uh, which looks like a skull to me, but it certainly doesn't look like a fossil. So what have we got here? No, you're absolutely right. It's not a fossil. This is a 3D print uh, in clear plastic of our Stegosaurus, Sophie. Mm -hmm. 
uh, which you can see outside in the public gallery. And this is something we based on the real skull bones of Sophie, which are in our collection. But because they're so fragile, rather than trying to stick them back together and mount them and put them on display, what we did instead was CT scan all those bones and use them to make various models of the skull through 3D printing and various other technologies. So we use this so that we can show people what the whole skull would have looked like because the individual bones are all scattered and they don't uh, join back together anymore. Right. Uh, but this, they're based on the real bones and we can show exactly how they used to link together without damaging those very fragile materials. So I'm guessing that 3D printing technology is transforming paleontology and allowing us to create these really accurate models. And of course, can you use those models in your research quite confidently, I guess, because you're not worried about, you know, if it breaks, it's not like you're damaging the, the only fossil you've got. No, they're exact replicas uh, down to however accurate your initial scans are. So often like sub-microscopic levels in some cases of accuracy. And those things are a lot more, a lot easier to handle. You can build them out of strong light material so you don't need to worry. And you, because of the techniques, you can make very tiny things much larger to look at them in more detail. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if maybe you work on tiny teeth and you want to see them much bigger and make them easier to handle, Yep. Or if you work on very large things like say sauropod legs or sauropod vertebrae, you can use your scans to make your printouts very small. So you can handle your little giant sauropod <laughs> and have it in your hand have without your hand. hurting your back while you're trying to turn it over. And as we saw in the video earlier, they can be huge bones. They are big <laughs> bones. Them very useful. Okay, I'm going to go for a couple more questions uh, that have come through. Uh, this one's from Donna Clayton on Facebook. She goes, Hi, uh, my seven-year-old son and husband argue regularly over whether the Therizinosaurus hope I pronounced that right, uh, was a carnivore or a herbivore. Uh, the books we have vary in answer. So is that a dinosaur you're familiar with? Yeah, Therizinosaurus is a very unusual dinosaur from Mongolia. We don't know very much about Therizinosaurus itself. It's only known from a few bits and pieces. Mm. But it's part of a bigger family of dinosaurs called Therizinosaurs, which are all very similar in general appearance. Yeah. And we have some really nice skulls of some of those animals. And from what we can tell, it looks like they're probably mainly plant eaters, but they might have taken animal food from time to time. So the good news is they're both right. And that this <laughs> is an animal go. that's an, an omnivore probably and it would probably be eating leaves and fruits and maybe small animals insects things like that so probably a fairly mixed diet for those guys oh, well there you go you're both correct in uh, in your uh, no thoughts more arguments. <laughs> excellent um uh we've got another question from ba facebook uh, this is from jonathan um he's saying uh, what does paul think about dippy leaving the hintzy hall so of course a lot of people might have heard of this in the news that our famous diplodocus uh, is now on the move what are your thoughts on that so i think it's actually a really good opportunity for us to get our message out beyond london so I thought there are lots of people in the uk that just haven't had the opportunity to come and visit us or so on. and it's one of our iconic specimens so being by being able to put it out on tour go around the uk lots more people will be able to see it than who might not be able to travel london and see it here in the museum so it's a great ambassador actually in lots of ways for the museum to go out show one of our key specimens and allow it to travel around the country so although I'm a little bit sad to see it leave Central I have to admit I have a lot of sentimental attachments to Dippy being there I'm actually really excited by the fact that we've got this opportunity now to go out to different places and take our message out in that different way and get other people excited about it as I am as well yeah it's a fantastic specimen it'd be great to see how it looks in other settings around the country Brilliant. I'm going to take one more question. Uh, this is from Chris on Periscope. Uh, uh, evidence, uh, were dinosaurs intelligent? That's an interesting one because uh, we do know that some dinosaurs had very big brains. And not just because they were big animals, but in the, in the smaller dinosaurs, they generally had quite large brains in comparison with the rest of their body size. So this is particularly small meat eaters, things like animals like Truodon, and some of the other things that are very close actually to the origin of birds. Now, th that kind of brain size... Uh, idea suggests that they might have been actually quite smart. So if we think about living dinosaurs, birds, some of them actually use tools. So crows are birds, they're smart, course, they yeah. use little sticks and things like that as forceps and as ways to wiggle grubs out. So these are animals that problem solve. It wouldn't surprise me if at least some dinosaurs weren't at least as smart as some of those guys. But I don't think they were anywhere near as smart as they say the Velociraptors in Jurassic Park. So I don't think right. I have to worry about them learning to Opening open doors, doors and or like that. program computers or anything like that. So. Brilliant. Good to know. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Paul. And uh, thank you guys for all of your questions. Uh, if, you, if we didn't get through all of them and you've still got more questions to ask, Paul is going to hop online and answer a few more for the next 10 minutes or so. So you can keep sending them in and we'll do our best to answer those. But thank you very much for watching. Uh, if you enjoyed the show, please share it with your friends and we'll see you next week for our next episode of NHM Live.